What's happening, my people? Welcome back to the channel, Telecom Asia Sports. And today we are going to be discussing a very hot topic in the world of football. It is Ruben Amorim and it is Manchester United. Now, off the back of an absolutely impeccable performance by his team Sporting in the Champions League against Manchester United's perennial rivals, Man City, it looks like there's hope on the horizon for the Red Devils. Let's talk a little bit about how Ruben Amorim is going to set up his United side in the coming weeks and whether or not this means United's fortunes are finally, finally going to turn around after, I think, a decade of underperforming since the departure of Sir Alex Ferguson. It would be a very interesting one. Amorim bowed out essentially from Sporting with an absolute bang showing what he's about. It was a devastating performance. He absolutely destroyed Man City in a 4-1 victory in the Champions League. Um, although he was aided by his star man, Gukurez. And many people are asking that he won't get that kind of player at United, at least not in the in the short term, whether or not even in the long term, because United are currently going through this period where they are essentially trying to build a structure beyond the manager. So essentially, similar to the structures that maybe Chelsea have in place, or Arsenal have in place, or Liverpool have in place, um, they are decided transfers are decided by the sporting directors and essentially coaches are supposed to come in and work with what they have but they're supposed to, they're supposed to fit the ethos that the club wants to go down so with chelsea and enzo mariska um recruitment in young exciting players and getting a coach who wants to play that kind of football and i think it's very telling the tag they've given amorim as head coach and not manager that this is what they intend to do so whether or not gokiris will come in is one to be decided i think there's a lot of dead wood as well that needs to leave man united and just based on the way Amorim is going to set up his sides, right? We know from his time at Sporting, he loves to play with a three-back. I think his starting formation is normally a 3-4-3 in a similar mold to Thomas Tuchel. And people are speculating that this might be interesting because of the number of wingers that are at Manchester United right now. We look at the likes of a Ganacho and Amad Diallo. We have an Anthony and then we have a Marcus Rashford all playing those wide areas and what that will mean for their careers, right? Um, we looked at the way Tuchel set up when he first came to Chelsea and there was an emphasis on their, their wing backs bombing forward especially. And I think one of the main reasons Amorin got this job was because he identified that um, United have a very good pair of send, um, wing backs. Um, we have Dalu on the left, I think, or the right. They have Dalu and Mazraoui essentially who are very capable both on an attacking front and defensively. And then with a back three of perhaps a Maguire, a Lissandro Martinez, and a Delict. Three very different players. You have um, somebody like Delict who is very combative, um, elegant as well on the ball. We have a diminutive breaker and destroyer in Lissandro Martinez. And in Harry Maguire, you have um, what is, in my opinion, a very good ball playing centre-back, but also one that is capable of being like a sweeper, in my opinion. So he plays a little bit further up and can sweep up and... Um, and essentially be the springboard for attacks. Maybe Casemiro can drop in um, instead of Maguire in that, in that role. So essentially he plays like a quasi CDM center half kind of player. And then uh, around him on either side, you can see a Bruno and maybe a Nugati, you know. So one is a destroyer and one is like an elegant ball playing uh, midfielder, similar in the mold of, um, if you remember the Fabregas and Matic pairing or the Fabregas and Kanti pairing. Very good, um, very good balance in that sense. You have one who's staying back and yeah, mopping up in Anugati and then Bruno Fernandes can sometimes win the ball back very high up, but also he's moving more as an eight and trying to be the bridge between the attack and then the defense. And then up front, Hoyland looks to be the man, I think, for the time being, even though he's not been able to necessarily impose himself on games and he's lacking that little bit of extra quality, I think under Amorim, he'll get a nod. If he doesn't work out, then I think United will look to, you know, shell out a little bit for other players. And around him is where it gets a little interesting because in a 3-4-3, especially when you have your wing backs bombing up and down, you're going to need players who can essentially cut inside as inside forwards or two number 10s. So it really depends on whether or not um, Bruno will be playing that um, center midfield role. Maybe, maybe Amore might come in and play Ericsson and Anugati. Ericsson as, you know, a deep line playmaker and then Anugati as like a box-to-box -box or maybe like a, a holding midfielder. And then you can have 
Bruno on one side as one of the tens, and maybe, maybe Mason Mount might finally get the resurgence he desperately needs at Manchester United and can play as that second number 10 because we saw him play that position in immaculate form in Thomas Tuchel's system. And really, Chelsea um, and his Chelsea career only began to suffer when Thomas Tuchel you know, left and then Chelsea changed their style of play to a more traditional 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1. And it, it was a struggle to find a place for Mounts in those teams. But he really excelled in those roles. Now, the problem there, or inside forwards, we did discuss inside forwards, and potentially if they are inside forwards, maybe then we might see a Rashford playing as a, a, a centre forward very close to the main striker and a Garnacho maybe also playing as well um, in that position. But it's very interesting whatever position or whatever role Amorim decides to take up um, for that formation, whatever rules he decides to play for his front three, it could mean that um, some of those players are impacted, right? So we look at uh, an Anthony who really struggled and is really struggling as, as a, a wide forward and a winger. It looks like his time might be up, right? It looks like an Ahmad Diallo's time might be up. It looks like a, a Rashford, maybe if he doesn't get to play as a winger and maybe you know, he struggles in that, you know, number 10 rule around the striker. His time might be up as well because he's really struggled as a winger or as even like a second forward in some of United's very recent matches. And then we look at players also like Ganacho who has really struggled um, in the last few weeks and maybe this might be the time to drop Ganacho and see how it works out. It really depends on how the first few weeks go for um, Ruben Amorim. If those two number 10s really do hit the ground running the way they, they, they work in uh, sports in Lisbon right now, then really there really won't be any need for those kind of wingers. Um, and maybe that's the, the, you know, the route that Ineos are going down, right? They are going to play that kind of expansive as expansive football and it, it looked to work a treat against Pep Guardiola and I think that's always the measure or barometer of success of any team how they come up or how they stack up against the Pep Guardiola side and from the evidence of what we saw in the Champions League it stacks up really well we saw it even in Tuchel's time at Chelsea against um, City it stacks up really well against Guardiola's teams uh, five at the back a three back you know Conte did it very well against um Pep Guardiola's Man City teams on, on, when he was in the Premier League uh, for Tottenham and Chelsea. So there are obvious, you know, benefits to that kind of system. And in that case, then we could see some of the futures of those players in question. Ironically, one player who very well sued the system for Amorim would be Jaden Sancho. Now, I don't know too much about the, the intricacies of the loan deal that they have with Chelsea, right? I, from what I know, it's an obligation to buy. So in that scenario, really, there's no hope for him back at United. But if it wasn't, I could very well see him playing as an inside forward in that, um, in that you know, front line, um, very near the striker. And that could be an interesting one if he does, you know, find his way back to United. Because as we all know, the problems were with the former manager. Um, and yeah, it would be very interesting to see how United play, if I'm being very honest. Because that performance in the Champions League was absolutely breathtaking. Like, yeah, it was, it was, it was something else to behold. Um, and to be honest, United haven't done too badly in the last few weeks, right? They really steadied the ship under um, Ruud van Nistelrooy. So it looks like there's quality in the side. Casemiro looks to be back to his best. So as a deep line midfielder, maybe, or even as a destroyer, but I don't think he has the legs to necessarily be able to mop up in a, a midfield too, especially if, you know, the likes of Eriksen or Bruno Fernandes are going to be his partners. If maybe it's a Casemiro Ugarte pairing, then maybe you know, Casemiro could essentially play as that center half and, you know, just drop deep and join what might be like a back six, um, essentially when those um, wing backs bomb forward, he slots in and it will be like a back four that's of center backs, essentially. And then Ugarte can kind of be like a box-to-box -box midfielder in a sense. If not, I think he will do very well as like a sweeper, similar to how in back fours of the past, um, Tuchel and... Antonio Conte utilized uh, an Aspilicueta very well in, in that centre-back, you know, role. And then played like a David Luiz as a sweeper um, or like a Rudiger as a sweeper in, you know, in those, in those periods where for Conte and, and, um, and Tuchel. But yeah, if United do manage to bring in Gilkeres as well, I think it won't take a lot, in my opinion, to transform, um, to transform Man United very quickly because... I mean, aside of a few players, honestly, aside of a few players, um, there's, there's, there's really good quality all around, in my opinion. There's really good quality all around. Um, yeah. 
but that's just how it goes, guys. I think, especially of the performance against City, right? Patience needs to be given for Ruben Amorim. You know, as much patience as was given to um, Eric Ten Hag, who didn't show nearly as much. I remember Eric Ten Hag's first Manchester derby was a massive drop, and I think it was like a four 0 or something. Um, Amorim has shown that he can he can beat Pep Guardiola and he can beat Man City. So a lot of patience needs to be given to this guy. He's probably one of the best young coaches in the world. And if he's able to get the structure around him set, and if he's able to implement um, his style of play, you know, I think it will be a very interesting time to say the least for the Manchester United faithful. But guys, please let me know what you think in the comments below. Are you excited for Amorim Ball at Manchester United? Please let me know in the comment section. And guys, if you enjoyed today's video, please consider leaving a like or subscribing to our YouTube channel, Telecommercial Sports. We have a ton of football content coming up. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.